Hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. I hope you enjoy the video. We are going to take a look on the different aspects of modeling compatible nodes in Autodesk Robot which is actually a request done by some of our new subscribers and I've checked YouTube and saw that there are not many videos that talk about this so I deemed it beneficial to talk about this in detail. Now this video is not going to be actually like a modeling large video, it's just going to touch on this compatible node issue. So it's a modeling intensive video rather than having a video where we model structures. So to explain this, I will basically open me a 3D building design template and I'm going to draw me three structures. One of them is going to be my reference structure, one of them is going to be the structure with the compatible node and one of them is going to be the structure with different or other aspects to try to mimic the compatible nodes. So I'm going to go to my axis definition. For the x-axis, I'm just going to enter x equals 0, 5, and 10. For the y-axis, 0, 6, and 12. And the z-axis, I'll leave it as 0 and 3. Those two values are given because we have opened the 3D building design. And this is basically defined by the story height, which was explained in a previous video about the building structures, or modeling structures, which is linked above. So I just basically apply that and close, and now I have a perfect grid. Now, to just reiterate the disclaimer, this is actually not going to be modeling of a real-life structure, rather than it's just going to be explaining a modeling technique in Autodesk Robot. And I need one full video for this, because it's not really clear what happens, and even if you try to read the Autodesk Robot help file, it is really extremely cryptic, this compatible node issue. All right, so I'm just gonna make me some beams, a W16 by 40 beam, of course you can choose any other beam. So I'm, so I'm gonna draw them like this. I just basically draw me my main beams, what are those beams? You can notice that I'm intentionally stopping here to continue drawing. So I'm intentionally stopping in the middle and continue drawing. Now I have my main beams. Now I need to like basically draw my secondary beams, which are like the beams are perpendicular to the main beams. So this is like basically my secondary beams. First beam like this. It's secondary beams, I think it's gonna be heavily loaded like this because the spacing between the beams is too much. So I just quickly video edit me some extra beams just to make it make more sense because secondary beams shouldn't be heavily loaded like main beams. So give me a second to video edit this. Okay, so by the power of video editing, I have added me more secondary beams. Now, of course, these structures don't look like this. The secondary beams could be, for example, be positions above the main beams, like what we did with parallels. So I'm going to do that. Now, to position something on top of something else, you need to use offsets. And I'm going to do this very quickly. And this has been explained before in a video dedicated to offsets. I basically offset my main beams down and offset my secondary beams above. So I'll just select my main beams, go to geometry, additional attributes and to offsets and well I'm gonna offset it to the upper flange so you see it went a little bit down now of course the secondary beams need to be offset above so I'll do that so I'll just select my secondary beams I'll use a selection tool which is basically all the tips and tricks and robot I select all the secondary beams lower flange and you can see that the basically the model makes more sense now of course, you need a support at those beams, so or even a column. So you can basically uh, select everything, go to edit, edit, move or copy, and well, you can move it up from here to here, and you can add you some columns. So I just add me six columns very quickly. I click on that, select a column. I'm gonna select W16 by 40 just for the sake of this. So I just basically start clicking. So I have my six columns now. Now, I'm going to give make me a very quick dry run. So if you dry run this, just by hitting the calculation button, there shouldn't be any instabilities, everything seems to be fine. And if you go to results, diagrams for members, click on MI and you see, well, it makes sense. Now, maybe it doesn't make sense for you right now, but if you basically click on those two elements and ask it in results, detailed analysis, and basically just open MI for the detailed analysis, you will see a very good moment diagram that is corresponding to a continuous beam. Reason being that my secondary beams have not been released. There is nothing special happening there. So that's why the moment diagram on them is a basically moment diagram for continuous beam. If you want to see it on your main structure like this, all you have to do is to play with the scale a bit. But of course, this will make the main beams explode like this because the main beams have larger moments. 
whereas the second trapezium has smaller moment. But if you increase the uh, scale and look from the side, at least you can start seeing the bending of the diagram of the secondary beams. The main beams now look ugly, but well, just for you to see. All right, so this is my first structure now, nothing special. Of course, you need to add a cladding like this. I'll just go to geometry, go to cladding. Now, those are secondary beams. It's just a small C structure, nothing special, but of course, since we are modeling, we should still uh, adhere to practical issues. So when you have a C structure, usually you are like having a a cladding or a reinforced concrete deck on top of your beams. This is your decision. You can put your secondary beams on top of your main beams. You can also put your secondary beams inside the main beams by connecting them with connections. It's up to you. This is a decision that the structure of an engineer has to do. Uh, but still, for me, uh, I'm just going to put the cladding, and of course, the secondary beams are going to be loaded by this cladding. It's not like it's a rod or a bracing or something. The secondary beams are going to be loaded, so... The nice thing that Robert does is that you don't need to draw them cladding by cladding. I have drawn it one time cladding by cladding just to show you the idea of drawing claddings, and this was done by the uh, video about warehouses and trusses before. But for now, I'll draw me one single cladding like this. One, two, three. Now you can notice that I intentionally drew it where the first line is in this direction, meaning that the local X of the cladding, which is this one, is in the global X of the structure. You can see that the local X is in the global X of the structure. Fantastic. Now one thing to notice is that I forgot to select that my cladding is going to be loaded in the one-way X. And to be honest, I intentionally tried to forget that because I want to show you how you can fix this issue. So basically, if you forget selecting the loading direction and just draw the cladding, you can fix that later by selecting the cladding, going to your object inspector and selecting the loading distribution direction. I want loading in X. I need to add me some loads. Of course, now I'm just going to assume some very quick nodes, like 10 kN to the dead. Of course, this is the responsibility of the structural engineer to do. For me, I'm just doing very quick loads here. My uh, goal is actually not to design or anything. My goal is just to show you the modeling aspects of compatible nodes. But of course, I want to have my structure somehow relatable. So, I mean, yeah, I'll just add me some dead live loads. And to finish this basically quick uh, revision, I can actually make me a combination 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live and just save or whatever you want and run the analysis again. And the first thing I like to do when run the analysis is to basically click VB or right click display, go to uh, nodes and ask him to show me the flow distribution regions just to make sure that my cladding is going to distribute correctly. And you can see that the claddings do distribute correctly. Of course, you can actually open the forces generated automatically just to see that, yep, the forces were applied on the secondary beams uh, because I wanted it to be like this. Now, you can see that the offsets have been removed. Uh, they are not removed, but the display of them is removed. So to re-display those offsets, then all you have to do is to click on model and basically open offsets and click apply. Now you can see the offsets once again. Now the offsets and their effect on the different aspects of moment diagrams and deflections has been explained before, so I will in a video link above, so I will not be repeating this. However, I want to talk about basically the uh, effect of com compatible nodes. Now to start with, I just want to check the diagrams for numbers and see the MI and click apply. Of course, I'm going to normalize this. Now, once again, you will see that the beams or the diagrams are dominated by the main beams because the values of the main beams are high, whereas for the secondary beams, you barely can see them. Now, of course, I'm just going to quickly remove those forces that were generated automatically because I want to see stuff. So, I'll just remove that very quickly. Now, you can see that uh, those diagrams are dominated by the main beams and the secondary beams seem not to have any moment. That's not correct. The secondary beams do have moments. You can see them by clicking on any secondary beam. Even you can right-click it if you want. And if you right-click it, you can actually open the diagram by using the object properties. You can open the diagram by NTM and say MOI. And you can see the diagram exists and there are values. But of course, the value of 20 is nothing in comparison with the value of 158 that is subjected uh, that, that those beams and columns basically feel. So that's why you don't see them. It's just a scale thing. 
Of course, if you want to take one beam and basically go into their details, you can select one secondary beam like this. Go to results, detailed analysis, which will open a new window, and you can of course select anything you want. You can even select a multitude of uh, things to show. So for example, I can select MY and FZ, which is really nifty. It's nice for uh, reports, if you want to make a report. You can select multiple diagrams and you can display them like this side by side. You can even click on the in point here and move a cursor, which will give you the corresponding value for the diagrams that you have active, which is a nice thing actually. So the point being here is that there exists a moment diagram on the secondary beams, but it's too small to be visible when we show the diagram. All right, fantastic. So I have my baseline structure. I didn't do any releases, so uh, there is still logic to be included. I've explained before in my previous videos that you should think of the connection between the beams and the secondary beams. Do you want them to be continuous? Do you want them to be simply supported? Do you want them to be offset or not? If you offset them, you could assume it's continuous. If you don't offset them, uh, then those beams will penetrate the main beam, meaning that in reality, the secondary beam will just start from, this, from the center of the beam move all the way here and end here and the other secondary will start from here move all the way and end here and of course it's the responsibility of the structural engineer to assume first of all the type of connection between the secondary beam and the, st and the other structures and also the type of modeling that you will use so if you assume now i know this is technical but i need to say this if you assume a, a rigid joint between the secondary beams and the structure, then you don't need to release anything. And of course, you need to design the rigid joint, which will resist moments. If you assume that the connection between the secondary beams and the columns is a pinned connection, then you need to release your secondary beams. Uh, of course, if you put your secondary beams on top of the main beams, you could assume that they are just a continuous beam. But you could release it at the end here because if you put a beam on top of the other beam, there might be no moment transfer. Once again, this is your responsibility. I'm only here to tell you that, hey, those possibilities exist and you need to think of it while you are modeling and while you are designing. Because everything you do in your model is your responsibility and will have implications in the future. If you assume something, then it's going to affect the design of the structure. All right, so while I was talking, I'm actually also working. So I'm just going to copy this twice. And you can see that I have now three structures. Wait, I have four? It seems that I have copied one extra. I'll just delete this extra one, basically. So I have three structures. If you run the analysis now, it will warn you that there are separate structures. But I'm already fine with this. I'm already keen with this. I know that there are separate structures. And now let's talk about this. Now the first structure is going to be my, my baseline structure. The structure that has no releases, nothing, it's just all nice and dandy. Of course, this structure is still, I cannot say inaccurate, inaccurate is such a harsh word, but I want to say that this structure still needs the input of a professional designer to make sure that the connections between the beams are exactly as he is willing and intending them to be on the site. Now, for this one, I will be using uh, compatible nodes, and for this one, I will be using release or vice versa, depending on the idea. Uh, now, I want to show you what compatible nodes is. So, to start with, what are compatible nodes? Now, I know you would think I should have talked about this uh, earlier in the beginning of my video, but no, I, I intentionally postponed talking about um, compatible nodes and the meaning of them for later because I need to show you this before I can talk to you about this. So the first thing is that I'm gonna basically remove all my display settings and get back to my default display settings. This will remove the offsets as display, but the offsets still exist. So like, don't get tricked okay. by the fact that you suddenly see no offsets. Those members are offset. All right, so now I have my structures. If you open the deflection shape, you can see a pretty, sim a pretty nice defined deflection shape where you can see that the main beams are deflecting, the secondary beams are deflecting, and there is no disconnection between the main beams and the secondary beams because it makes sense. I mean, the secondary beam and the main beam deflect together. Now, this leads to the idea that a shared node, and now we need to focus a little bit, let's talk about shared nodes. Now, if you go and open the node numbers like this and open the member numbers like this, you can see that, for example, this point number five actually shares member 10, 
member nine, member two, and member three. Let's talk a little bit about this. See, because node number five is shared between all the elements, it is absolutely logical that the deflection of all the members are going to be the same at the point number five. What do I mean by this is, if you open the deflection shape, those elements are connected at node number five, and that's the reason why all the members deflect the same. Now, to repeat what I'm saying, when you have a node that is connected to multiple elements, the deflection of the node is the same as the deflection of the ends of that element, meaning, if this node, for example, goes like, I don't know, 20 millimeters downwards, this means that this beam is going to go 20 millimeters downwards, and this beam's end is going to go 20 millimeters downwards, and this beam and all the beams are going to go the same, because they are connected to the same node. Now, what do compatible nodes mean? So let me just color them so that you can easily detect them. So what I'm trying to say is that compatible nodes will somehow disconnect uh, the blue elements from the yellow elements, the secondary beams from the main beams. And we're going to do that in a moment. So I'll just open my offsets to make sure that you can see that. All right, so let's take a look on how compatible nodes are translated. So let's take a look on this one, on this node. To define a compatible node, I'll go to geometry and go to additional attributes and, R and consider compatible nodes. And I'm going to define me a new compatible node just to explain the ideas behind it. So I click on new, and now this is where the compatibility issues happen. Now I'm just going to explain the uh, compatibility not as an elastic or damping or gap. I'm going to explain the compatibility as in rigid body motions, meaning the uh, connection and disconnection of those elements in the directions that we are going to discuss in a moment. So allow me to show you this. I will call this compatibility one. And I will be, first of all, I'll block everything. So uh, I basically say, I'm basically saying that those two bars are going to be connected in all those uh, directions, which means that this is basically my initial condition. There is nothing compatible here. It's connected in all directions exactly as it should be. Because I told you before that element number five, for example, here, Whatever it does affects all the elements that are connected to element number five. So if I use my compatibility conditions on node number 38, and on all of them, like I'm telling him, hey, node number 38 connects all those directions of those beams, it basically means that I have added nothing. But I just want to show you how it looks like, and I want then to start changing those settings and discussing with you how those settings affect what you see in your structure. So I'm going to add my compatibility node on node number 38. So I'm just going to click on this, go to my node 38, make sure I can somehow grab it, and click on that. And when you click on that, the following things change. First of all, you can see that there's 38 and 118 together besides each other. The reason why you have two nodes together besides each other is because Autodesk Robot actually defined you a new node. So there is a new node on top of node number 38. There are now two nodes on top of each other at the same position, which is weird, but it makes sense. Wait for a moment, I will tell you exactly what I mean by this. Now, uh, node number 38, well, still connects the all four elements, but node number 118 will connect two of the elements to group them together, because we want now to basically separate the behavior of this beam and the behavior of this beam at the point number 38. So point number 38 is going to be responsible of all the elements that are not included by L node number 118. Now to select the elements that are included in node number 118, you can see that in the table, when I clicked on 38, a new node was defined, which is 118, and robot asks you, what are the bars that are considered to be separate from the other bars. Now, I don't know exactly, so I have to open my bar numbers. And you can see that you have bar number 39, 38, and bar number 32, 33. Which means, which means now that I want those two guys to be one group with a certain behavior, and those two guys to be another group with another certain behavior. Now, if you hit on apply, uh, things change, and you can see that there are two nodes suddenly here. One node is responsible for those two elements, 
and another node is responsible for those two elements. Now, remember, when I defined my compatible nodes, I actually didn't do anything. Like, I just said, hey, define me a compatible node and link everything together. Now, linking everything together is the standard practice because one node responsibility is to link all the members together. So if you run the analysis, no differences should be visible. Oh, sorry, I didn't run the analysis. Now, if you run the analysis, no differences should be visible. So if you click on OK, you can see that the analysis has been completed. And well, if you basically, for example, select results, diagrams, or basically open the deflection shape, just to make sure, make sense of it. Now, there are a lot of things happening here, so I want to remove my cross sections. And I want to uh, just normalize my deflection shape scale. Okay, so if you hit the deflection shape, there is actually nothing much happening. It's extremely identical. You have the same, you have the same deflection shape. Of course, the deflection values could be all over the place, but that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to explain compatible nodes. Now, yes, there are two nodes defined here, as you can see, and those two nodes are linked together. There is no independence between them. They depend on each other. And having everything dependent means that, well, it's basically one node. It's similar to my baseline problem. Now, let's start tweaking a little bit and understanding what compatibility nodes are uh, from those settings. Now, node number 118, which connects those two bars, and node number 38, which connects those two bars, those are now compatible. The node that is connecting 33 and 32, as well as the node that is connecting 39 member and 38, they are sharing everything. Now, what happens if I remove UZ? This means now suddenly that those two bars, which is the secondary beam, 39 and uh, 38, those two bars, and those two bars, the main beam, 33 and 32, are suddenly separated. And this is going to be really intriguing. So allow me to show you what happens if I do that. It's really going to be eye-opening when I run the analysis. There is no amount of words that can explain what you will see when I run the analysis. So if I now open the reflection shape, sorry, you will see something very strange. You will see suddenly that the secondary beam deflects totally independent from the main beam. Why is this happening? And a very intriguing thing is that the independency of the secondary beam, you can see it deflecting a lot because the secondary beam is a weak beam, it's a C channel. This and, I mean, the deflections of the charts right now. But uh, you can see that the secondary beam deflects separately from the main beam. Why is that? Because the secondary beam is connected to, to node 118, whereas the main beam is connected to node 38. And what we did is we have told robot that those two nodes, 118 and 38, are not connected in the Z direction, but they're connected, but they're connected everywhere else, meaning that uh, they share the X displacement, they share the Y displacement, and they share all rotations, but they don't share the movement or the displacement in Z, and that's the reason why suddenly the secondary beam is as if it doesn't feel the main beam. There is no sharing there is no connection between the UZ of those two elements. And, well, I hope that this at least makes sense to you. Now, why would you use that? This is something I might be talking about later. You have very limited situations where you need to use compatible nodes. One of them is the ability to basically, because remember in my Hangar video and in my Trust video, this is one video that I've explained before, I explained that there was a problem where my bracings were intersecting the purlins and they were having the same deflection. And I fixed it differently by going to analysis, uh, analysis types and going to the structural model and doing some stuff here. Please check out that video. It's really interesting to see. Now, this is another option to do that, but I will be diving deeper into it and explain the usage of this in action in other structures. For now, the only thing I want in this video is to show you the effect and the meaning of compatible nodes. All right, so how, now how does robot do that? How does robot actually perform compatible nodes? Now, this is extremely technical and similar to the offset video, I'm going to try my best to 
make you see it. I'll be using my third structure to try mimic this. Now, I only, I know I only made a compatible node where the Z direction is not connected, meaning that the secondary beam suddenly behaves totally independent from the main beam. This is what compatibility nodes do. To recap this very quick, quickly, compatibility nodes basically define a copy of the node on the same position of the original nodes and connects them together. And then you, the designer, split all the elements connected to that node that we had four. You split them into two groups, as you have seen before when I did that. So I said that 33 and 32 are one group and 39 and 38 are another group. And then I told him, hey, those two groups share everything but the UZ, meaning that the UZ is not shared amongst those two groups. I've used this before, before uh, in my advanced modeling techniques when I'm personally modeling stuff. A part of my series is going to be in the very near future is to going to be to start modeling stuff like transmission towers, towers, water tanks, elevated water tanks. So there are some structures to be modeled, but for now I'm just focusing on the very basics. Okay, so now let's try with our third structure to mimic, to basically investigate how robot does compatible nodes. Now this is extremely technical and requires you heavy knowledge in the finite element method. Now, I am knowledgeable in the finite element method, it seems, so I'll just very quickly do that. Now, I'm just going to do this trick, copying this element. I'm just going to video edit this very quickly, give me a second. Okay, uh, just a quick update. While doing my magic of video editing, this is really going to be a nightmare, to be honest. I mean, I'm really happy that you don't see this behind the scenes. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to basically copy my main beam and move it down a little bit, and then play a little bit with the sections, so... I'm just gonna continue casting my spell until the magic of video editing accomplishes, so wish me luck. Okay, uh, a quick update again. I think this is working. I just copied my main beam a little bit down and copied it with dragging, so I'm gonna delete. Yeah, I think this is working. Now I can tell you that by the magic of video editing, grueling video editing, I might add, I have basically uh, played a little bit with my main beam and lowered it a little bit down. Now I know this has all kinds of issues with off uh, offsets. But remember, the goal of my third frame is just to show you how robot actually performs this compatibility node. It's really interesting to understand. Oh, I have a problem. Okay, good. I can solve the problem with camera. But the idea is that it's really interesting to see how uh, the, the behind the scenes of finite element method. To understand not only that the software does something, but how the software does that. It's extremely important for you as a career, as a civil engineer in your career. All right, I have overlapping elements. I'm guessing that because I dragged stuff, things went haywire. So I'm, I'm guessing it's in this region, but let's take a look overlapping. Yeah, exactly, it's in this region. Uh, the, when I copied and dragged, it created a new element and it overlaps with the column. I, I suspect it as much. So and how do I fix that? How do I fix that? Yeah, okay, I just delete this. I think this should work. Okay, yes. Okay, yeah, I think it will work, and we'll delete this. Because when I dragged, it actually defined me a small little thing here. So I think this will fix the problem right there. Yeah, I mean, I told you, I'm not... When, I'm, when I mess up, I don't video edit my mess ups. I want you to see everything, I want us to see every mistake, and so that you can learn from my mistakes, or basically from my problems, problem-solving skills. All right. So let's open the deflection shape now. Now the deflection shape of our modified uh, structure is still somewhat similar to our main structure because there are no compatibility nodes. There are no compatible nodes. Whereas here it's totally different because I have a compatible node between the secondary beam and the main beam. And you can see that I have released or let's say I have made independent the deflection in the Z direction for both elements. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you how robot does that. Now, this is going to be an approximation, mind you. It's not going to be 100% perfect, but I want to show you how the approximation works. So what happens is, robot defines, or basically all softwares, define a small element between the two compatibility nodes. Because look, in the process, I actually defined two nodes. And this is exactly what happened here. Robot defined you two nodes. But of course, I define two nodes that are a little bit spaced apart because I want you to see it. I want you to understand what happens here. So it helps my visualization. And robot in the compatibility issue, if you basically make a direction independent, 
it changes the stiffness value of that direction. So for example, let's say that I want my UZ to be independent. Uh, this means that the axial stiffness of this thing needs to be changed, it needs to be reduced. And how do I do that? Well, I am going to assume me a very small section. Mind you, this is an approximation. I will basically define me a parametric section. Now, this is extremely technical now, but so I'll just do it anyway. So I'll just define me a very small area. I know what robot does behind the scenes because I have my own finite element software that I'm programming. So I'm extremely aware of what robot is doing behind the scenes, but uh, it's really hard to replicate here because what happens is, what ends up happening is, robot is playing with the axial stiffness of this element and it's basically making a very small stiffness. Now you know that delta equals PL over AE so the area and the elastic modulus do play a part in the stiffness of this element. I can reduce the area how much I want but the elastic modulus of steel is still large so I don't know. Now I've made a very small area which will have numerical problems. It's a mess actually. But I'll just try my best. I hope that it works. So let's run the analysis. Fingers crossed. Yeah, see, now I have problems because of my section. I just, if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, then I will only tell you what happens. Oh, it did work. Oh, lovely. I love it. Perfect. I'm, uh, to be honest, I, I doubted myself. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I didn't actually expect it to be working because, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm really happy now. Uh, Fine, so what ends up happening here is that I was able to replicate for you the compatible nodes and show to you how robot actually does perform that. Uh, he basically defines, or robot defines an element, defines two nodes, and now this node, this node number 120, is responsible for those two elements, and node 38 is uh, responsible for those two elements. And you can see that I have replicated compatible nodes, at least for this one, uh, quite successfully. I'm really happy. I'm proud of that, to be honest. Uh, which is similar to what Robot does, but Robot does it much neater. Uh, so now, I think that this should eliminate any further discussions about compatible nodes and should make sense to you, because when I replicate something in front of you and you can see how Robot does that in the finite element software, then, well, it's going to be nice and dandy. I mentioned that I'm working on a finite element software, and that's true, and since I'm done almost, I just want to show you a very quick glimpse of it, which is this little guy. It's my little own project that I'm trying to garnish, and I'm just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I might give you some updates about this in the future, but I just wanted to tell you that the reason why I know what happens behind the scenes is because I personally program my own finite element software. It's still incomplete, but uh, wish me luck with that. Anyway, uh, I think that I have done everything regarding compatible nodes. Uh, of course, the once again I'm reiterating, the goal of this video was to explain to you the uh, logic behind uh, compatible nodes, so I hope that I was successful in that. So yeah, I think we have successfully shown to you a benchmark structure a structure with compatible nodes and a pseudo structure where I personally have tried to implement compatible nodes myself and you can see that the implementation is quite accurate. I'm really proud of my accuracy to be honest. I'm not surprised and uh, as once again as per usual I hope that this video was beneficial for you and that you enjoyed it. Now if, you, if this video was beneficial for you and you have enjoyed it of course please don't forget to like, share, subscribe and comment. And maybe uh, suggest this channel to your friends. They might find this stuff interesting and personally it helps me grow my channel. So thank you very much for watching and as per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we will catch you in the next video.